Oh, that's too fun. Hey, I know that Mike starts out like this because we took it from Revision and we start out like this at our church too. So you're going to need to help me out because it'll help me go. I'm glad to be here. How about you? Come on, let's make some noise. I fired up for today. <laughs> I, uh, I love it. And I'm just so grateful to be here. Like Mike said, my name is Tony and I, uh, I really do have the the honor and the privilege of being a part of his family, and uh, they are just so many wonderful uh, people. And uh, I've been married to Mike's sister now for 12 and a half years, and uh, we just it's just been incredible to get a front row seat in watching how God has had his hand on the whole Howard family, and uh, it's just pretty, pretty remarkable. I want to, uh, before I dive into the message, I just want to tell you a little bit about what I think about Mike and Jenny. I think they are two of the most gifted people I've ever met in my life. And I would tell Mike this right to his face because I just believe it to the core of my being that I think he is one of the most gifted communicators and and scholars. I I think what Revision has in Des Moines and having him to be uh, really the the point leader of this church, you are so blessed. And and so I just am so grateful for him. He has been so, yeah, you can give it up. I'm going to make you clap for the rest of the staff in a second, though, too. Mike and Jenny not only, you know, lead this incredible church. Um, but they have shown such incredible hospitality to so many people. They are generous, and uh, they just open their doors, and they have so many people in and out of their house constantly. And, and again, you just, you just need to know how, how blessed you are, and, and he's not paying me to say that. That is just like actually how I feel about my brother-in-law, and, and I just love him, and I just love their whole family. But that's not it for this staff. I get to lead a church in Washington, and our church... Uh, gets heavily influenced by what's going on here in Des Moines, right, at Revision. Our youth director, you know, follows right alongside with what your youth pastor's doing and uh, what Jeff's doing, what Grant's doing, what, um, it's just incredible to see Courtney and what she does with Reach Des Moines. Can you just help me say thank you to your incredible staff because they've been so good to me and you. So let's just love them well. They're so good. They are just so, here's, and then I'll get in I actually believe this to be true about this gift that we have here at Revision. It's a gift to have a church like this. This is so not normal, and you know that. I think you, I think you actually intuitively know that a church starting just four and a half years ago doesn't look like this, and this is God's hand and God's favor on, on this church and on these leaders, and I actually believe there's a great responsibility that comes with it. And uh, your church and our church, as we kind of take hold of Iowa and we say, yeah, Mike, you get to go into the fun cities of Des Moines and around, and I'll go to rural Iowa, which my wife still wonders why, you know. And, and, uh, but, but as we do this together, God is, it's like he's increasing our territory. He's giving us more opportunities to be responsible for for really the spiritual climate of our state. And so just good job. Know that we're looking up to you as, uh, as, as people are paving the way, and I'm just so grateful for that. But today I do want to start off by asking you a question. Is there anything in your life right now that, quite honestly, I know this is kind of a pretty candid, you know, early way to start off, but is there anything right now in your life that you would say, I just need to be done with that? It's just something that, that you've allowed to linger too long in your life. In Washington, we would say it a little bit different. That's a kind of proper Des Moines sounding. We'd say, is there anything in your life that just gots to go? You know, it's like, it's like we, just, we gotta get right. Is there anything that just gots to go in your life? But you've allowed this thing to stay in you, to stay a part of you for far too long, and it's just time for you to be done with that, or it's time for you to get that out of your life. And, and there's been times in my life where I've actually had these, you know, images come to me where I said, it's, that's got to leave. This cannot be in our home any longer. And one of those times actually happened after my girls, I have four daughters, after a handful of them came and stayed at Mike's house uh, for a weekend. And me and Carrie were excited that we were kidless. You know, that was a win. But they came home, and my daughters came home different than when I had sent them that way. You see, they had came to Mike's house as Dallas Cowboys fans. And rightfully so. They, I think they are better. But what I found out is that Mike actually threatened not to feed my oldest daughter until she decided that she would be a Chicago Bears fan. And when she came home, yeah, and you're like, that's our pastor. I'm like, yeah, that's your pastor. I would never do that to his kids. But, but he did it to mine. <laughs> and I remember her walking into our front door going, Dad, I got some news to share. And, and as she, I was like, what's up? And he, she goes, oh, I'm, I'm a Chicago Bears fan now. And Mike wouldn't feed me. <laughs> and... I said, well, you can sleep outside if you want because you don't got a bed anymore if you're not. (laughs) But I just had this thought. There are some things that we're told that's got to go. There are sometimes some things that we start to believe that we need to be done with. A little bit different 
analogy, my best friend, he's on staff with me at City Point Church, his name is Sam, and Sam is uh, just finishing up a, an entire house flip that he's done, and there's a couple evenings that he would invite me out to, to help do some grunt work. I'm not good at really anything, home remodel or anything like that, but if I needed to carry something, he'd be like, oh, you could do that, and it's not going to screw anything up, and so I remember a couple times he'd say, hey, we're going to lay some flooring, he'll do the hard cuts, and I'll just carry the floor, you know, I'll just, I'll just move it around. And there was one evening that he was making some of the cuts in the basement of his house, and they're expecting a child, and so there was kind of this timeline that they needed to be done with, and all of a sudden one night I heard him screech in the basement, and this was a little abnormal for a grown man to screech like that, and, and shortly after he just said, help, come down here, and, and I just kind of stood there and laughed. I was like, that's funny, I want to see if he does that again, and he did, you know, he screamed again, and I was like, what's up, and he's like, there's something down here. And I remember going downstairs, and he's holding on to a crowbar, you know, like curled up in the corner. I thought, you got like one month until that baby comes, and you cannot act like that no more. <laughs> but I said, what is it? And he's like, it's a snake. There's a big snake in here. And that some of you are like, dang, that's it is a, it's a big snake. And, and I, I don't know about you, but there's something within me that kind of gets excited about it. I got like a little bit of adrenaline issue. And so I was like, there's a snake. Let's go. You know, this is going to happen right now. And so I, I looked over. And I saw a crowbar. And I also saw a giant sledgehammer. I said, you take the crowbar. I got the big tool. And so, so I said, where is he at? And he thought he's over here. So we threw a brick down into the corner. And out comes this giant snake. Giant to me. And I'll show you a picture in a second to prove it. But well, that snake didn't last very long because that snake's got to go. Here's a picture of the snake that I'll put on the screen for you. It was, a, it was a snake. I mean, it was not some garden down in this basement. And I just had this reality. I was like, when, with a baby on the way, you cannot have snakes in your basement. You just can't. And so we took care of it. And, and here's the point that I'm driving to. There are some things in our lives that we just got to be done with. That just got to go. And the truth is, with Jesus... When you have Jesus in your life, there are some things when you belong to Jesus that they just don't belong with you. There are some things when you have Jesus in your life, there are some lies that you no longer allow to plague you and to move you forward. There are some things in the basement of your life that you just got to say, hey, now that I belong to Jesus, there are some things that just no longer belong in me. And I got to move forward. And I can't let those things stick around any longer because they have the potential to damage the relationships around me that I love far too much. And that's the hope that we have in Jesus, is that he wants to take not only our lives, but the inner parts of us and to move us towards the very things that he has in store, the good parts of who he is. And I love how Paul affirms this. Paul's a church planner, and you have heard Mike teach on this man. But went around starting so many wonderful churches, and he writes this letter to the church in Corinth, and here's what he says. It's one of the most powerful verses of mine. I love this, and I hold on to this verse, and if you're a note taker, you can jot this one down, because we're going to just state this is pretty basic stuff for me. I don't try and pretend to be something that I'm not. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, this is a life verse for me. It says this, that this means that anyone who belongs to Jesus, anybody who belongs to Christ, love that. We'll hit on this in a little bit has actually become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has become. There's something significant to this concept of belonging to Jesus that when you belong to Jesus, there are some things that no longer belong in you. And they just got to go. But that word belong, I just want to share real you know, briefly four just quick hits on what this belong word means to me. And some of these things, you know, I took from Mike, so they'll sound very familiar to you. The first one is this, that it's okay to belong before you believe. And... And this is a message that our church has learned from your church. Because I've heard Mike teach on that very concept that it's okay for you to be here and you might be here and you might go, hey, I'm not even all in on the Jesus thing right now and yet you are so welcome to come and explore your faith. Actually, I can't wait for you guys to have Mike back next weekend. My, one of my jobs is just make sure that you want him back, not me. <laughs> it's just like, which won't be hard for you. But for you to just continue to say, you know what? I'm willing to journey along in this thing called faith and to learn more about this person named Jesus because of just everything that compels me to be with him. See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and you can search for him in this place. You are safe here. That it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or what's been done to you, you can journey right alongside of this group of faith. And I believe that the longer you do, the more you'll find out that Jesus is worth giving every ounce of your life to. 
Love that first one, that it's okay to belong before you believe. The second one is that anyone can belong to Jesus, that this is an invitation for all of us, and we'll never forget that, that everyone is welcome. Everybody's welcome in this Father's house that Grant sung about before I got up here, that this is a wide open door for everyone to come and explore. The third one is that being at church, though, doesn't mean you belong to Jesus. I believe it's an indicator, but it's not a guarantee. And that's just something that I just want to make sure we all know, and we all know that. That's intuitively we know, that just because I show up to church doesn't necessarily mean that I belong, that there is something that I do. I give my life to this Jesus so that I can accept him fully and give my entire life to following after him, being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And yet the fourth insight that I just wanted to share real briefly is that when you belong to Jesus, again, some things don't belong to you. And so can I ask you the question again, what's in your life right now that just got to go? What's in your life right now that you would just say, you know, I got to be done with that? Maybe for some of us in the room, if we were really honest, it's a critical uh, spirit. And just the longer you self-reflect on this, you might go, it's, it's not even a, it's a behavior of mine. I know that this pattern in my life, it comes up again and again, and, and it's something that just damages the people around me. There are some things that I do that when I'm doing them, people around me just don't like being around me. What's in your life right now that you would say, it's just got to go, it's, I gotta be done with that. I just, it's about time for me to move forward. Quite honestly, for my life, how I've just defined all of those areas, those trouble spots in my life, and you would know this to be true as well, is just sin. Anything in your life that damages the relationships around you, your relationship, your relationship with God and other people, I'm reminded constantly of how much work I still have left to do in my own life because of how often I'm reminded of the sin issues that I have I'm actually reminded of these every time that our family does family pictures, and my sister-in-law is in the room right now, too, and so she knows, you know, family pictures have a way of making us sin more, just so you know, in my house, and probably yours, too. It's like, we put on the smiley faces, but everyone wants to kill each other, and a couple of years ago, I had this moment where I was just reminded of how big of a, you know, just how far from God really I still am. You know, I'm, I'm doing my best to follow him, but there's just things in my life that I got to get past, and, and we had scheduled a, you know, a... a a family photo shoot, and I remember getting home late, which was irritating to my wife, and I walk in, I see the girls, and they're all dressed, which kudos to her, that's next to impossible, and then I went upstairs to go get my clothes on, which were laid out for me by my wife, and as I round the corner, I turned, and I looked at her, and I had one of those moments that maybe you've experienced before, where you're like, I know I shouldn't say what I've just thought, but I couldn't catch it quick enough, and it just came out, and the words that came out reminded me how big of a sinner I am. I just said, I looked at her, and I did the once up, I said, you're going to wear that? And she just said, well, you're not going to be in the picture, so I'm going to kill you. I'm just going to kill you right now, like, we don't even need to have you around, and, and it's just this great reminder of how sin damages our lives, our selfishness, our language, our attitudes. And I'm telling you what, I want to keep growing. I don't want to let the parts in the basement of my life hold me back from the good thing that God has for me. I want to show you a chart. It'll be on the screen. And this is a chart that I really kind of feel like describes me. And you'll see on one side of the chart this idea of just being in total defeat. Without Jesus, we are just totally defeated. And there's no hope in our lives. There's no purpose for our lives. And we live life just striving to grab hold of significance and meaning, and I remember actually what it's like to be there. Some of you, you might be there right now. And I know that when I chose to step over the faith line, is what we call it at our church back in Washington, when I chose to give my life to Christ and surrender everything that I had, I felt like I was on my way to just to growing in Jesus and on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to experiencing life to the full, what the Bible talks about. And yet there was this gap. I accepted Jesus. I'm not dead yet. I'm not in heaven. And now I got life to live. There's, there, there's part of me that it's going to need to grow and, and to mature and to, to move on with. And, and I'm telling you, that part right there is not easy. Especially if we forfeit the areas in our lives that are holding us back. And so again, I just want to compel you today. Is there an area this morning that you would say, and I know God's been working on this in my life for far too long. 
for me not to pay attention to this guy from Washington, Iowa, and to listen to the words of Scripture and allow it to penetrate your heart and just say, God, you can have every part of me. Not just my salvation, but you can have the workings of my spiritual life as I just grow more to follow you more with my entire life. The verse says it again, I'll put it on the screen. This means that anyone who belongs to Jesus, to Christ, has actually become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. So what I want to do for the rest of our morning is I just want to share three, I'm going to call them insights from this one verse that I think move us towards this idea that we can be done that there is hope with Jesus. And so if you're a note taker, you can jot this down. The first insight is that the word anyone actually means there's hope for everyone. And that's great news. The word anyone means there's hope for everyone. I love what it says. It says anyone who belongs to Christ. Those five words are convicting words that motivate me to do what we do. To do church. To do church the way we do it. So that anyone can show up at any time and there's hope presented to every single person, the promise that you don't have to clean up before you show up, that there's hope for us if we are far from God is one of those things that I just will hold on to for the rest of my life. And yet what I know about you, because it's true about me, I'm my own worst enemy that I'll say, yeah, that word anyone means there's hope for you all, but not me. Because if you really knew the insides of me, you would know that Jesus probably didn't love that part of me too. Because there's insecurities of being vulnerable and saying, I would just as rather say it's for for everybody else, not me. I'm, I'm too far. I'm too far gone. And the truth is, if we serve a God who sent his son for all of us, the word anyone means there's hope for everyone. And we see this displayed throughout the Gospels. Some of you, you'll write down this chapter of the Bible and you'll do your own homework this week. But in John chapter 8, There's this powerful story of Jesus interacting with a woman who has been caught in adultery. A horrific sin. And what they do is they they shame her. They actually grab her out of the act and they drag her in front of Jesus. And what they're wanting for Jesus to do is to kind of go, yeah, you know... You know how I said it's for everyone, but it's everybody but her. You know, she's, she's a little bit too far gone. She's, and that's what they were wanting. They were trying to put this woman in front of Jesus and go, is there really grace and is there really hope for her, for everyone, Jesus? What about her, the worst of us all? And if you grew up in church or maybe you've been around here long enough, you know what Jesus does. He actually gets on his feet and he meets her in her lowest spot of life and full of shame In guilt, I love that song. Again, just leave the guilt and shame at the door because we got places to go. That's got to go. We got things to do. And Jesus gets down and it's his grace that attracts her to his love. And it's it's his truth that says, I'm going to set you free by telling you to go and sin no more. There are some things in your life that got to go. But make no mistake, my Grace will meet you in your lowest spot. The word anyone means there's hope for everyone. And then if you know the scriptures well, you know that in Luke chapter 15, we see Jesus sharing these stories. He calls them parables. And there's these three stories back to back to back of the Father's heart being on display that you might wander away and you might find yourself lost at time, but there's still hope for you. You have not gone too far, strayed too far away for there to be love for you. The word anyone means there's hope for everyone. And in this third story, you see this father have an interaction with his son, Luke chapter 15. And the son goes up to his dad and says, Dad, you know that inheritance that, that I'm going to get when you die? He's like, can we just fake your funeral so I can get the money now? It's like, I would rather you die now so I can get the money now. And the dad's like, well, I'm not ready to die. So you can't. But, but he gave him his money. He said, take what you want. You know, here you go. And the father sends his son off, and the son wanders away. And he goes, and he, he, he just wastes all his money. And he, he, what he's trying to do is find purpose for his life and meaning and significant. And what he doesn't know yet is that he'll never find it apart from his father, apart from this, this dad. And so he actually comes to his senses. And you maybe know the story. And he comes home, and he, in the back of his brain, is going, oh, no, 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 no. I've wandered too far away. I made too many mistakes. There's not a chance. My dad will still love me. Maybe, maybe. 
He'll move me to Washington, Iowa and help feed some pigs and work in the cornfields. Maybe he'll do that. But if you know the story, you find out that this father's heart runs out to his son. And what I think he puts on display is the first part of that verse, anyone. You can't run too far from God's love. And would you just forever be reminded that there's hope for you, that the word anyone, anyone who belongs to Christ, and don't ever exclude yourself from that statement, because me and you all, we need it. We need to know that we're included, and the truth is there are people in our lives that need it as well. That's why this church, I think, is so special, because this church has a focus to not only help us grow up and to know Jesus more, but to make sure that we reach the community and the world around us. It's just a beautiful thing that's going on right here, and which I believe this is to be true. I'll put it on the screen. Everyone has a someone who needs Jesus. Who is it in your life? Everyone has a someone who needs Jesus. Jesus in them. The second insight that I want to share with you is that there is a new available for you. There's a new that's actually available for you. It says this in the second part of that verse. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has actually become a new person. There's a new that's available to you, and that's great news because there's some old ugly in my life that I am glad at times that there's a new available for me, that I don't have to stay in the old and the dingy. I, I can clean up the basement and actually make it usable for the next season of my life that doesn't have to stay in the shame and the dungeon parts of me. There's a new available for you. And Paul goes on to write another letter to the church in Ephesus where he says this, and it's just so beautiful to receive this over you. It's a promise spoken over us who are in Christ, who belong to him. He says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. When's the last time somebody's just looked at you? I said, man, you're a masterpiece. Actually, if my wife told me that, I'd feel pretty good. You know, I'd be like, oh, yes, I am. <laughs> but, but you are a masterpiece, and that's how God sees you. And that's what he wants for you. And you might not feel like it, but it's not dependent on your feelings. It's dependent on your Father's heart over you. So would we remember that you're a masterpiece, but then he goes on to say he has actually created you anew. He's created you new in Jesus so that we can do the good things he's planned for us Long ago, I want to read you a story of a man named Tim. Tim is a part of our church in Washington, and a couple years ago, I got the privilege of baptizing Tim and his family, and to see the newness that's happening in his life is nothing short of a miracle from God. He actually shared this at his testimony. He says, Jesus was a part of my life until I was around seven. I grew up in a family that had gotten their life, but at seven I ditched it. Our family decided to move to a new place, and I remember losing all interest in a relationship with God. Fast forward to my early college years, and I actually started to wonder more about who God was and what Jesus was all about and how he fit into my world. I tried praying and even doing some religious things. He says, oddly enough, I even thought it would mean something if I got some religious tattoos, some symbols, you know, on my arms, which, by the way, they're really cool tattoos on this guy. He says, I thought doing those things would be good enough that they would fill the void in my life. He says, fast forward to a couple years ago, Jesus was not in my life at all. And at the age of 35, I, I thought I had it all figured out. I really didn't need God or anything other than myself because I thought I had the answers to life. Then one day, early in fall, our neighbors invited us to a new, newer church that had just started, and I politely listened but had no intentions of attending. I wasn't about to be around people who closed their eyes and raised their hands, and he just he said, that's way too weird for me, which just so you know, that is just kind of weird for people who didn't grow up going to church to see a bunch of us in church, and it's just the reality. It's just good to remind yourself. He said, I remember telling myself, if I go, I'm going to sit, listen, and then I'm going to leave, and that's it. Okay. Well, his neighbors kept inviting him, he says, and telling us that we should just come and see, that it wasn't going to be what we thought and that we'd love it. So finally, that October, I asked my wife, Ashley, if we could attend, and when I, that's when I found out that she had been wanting to go for a long time, but just waiting for me to ask her. So we checked it out, and it was okay. And I was like, that's the review you gave? You know, like, man, it wasn't revision, but it was okay. <laughs> it, was like, it was okay. Tony was okay. And the, band, the music was, it wasn't Grant, but it was good, you know. So we kept attending, but I still wasn't sold, he wrote. I was a skeptic, and I had lots of questions. But we kept attending, and over time, I actually started to look forward to it. Then July hit. And here's what I know. All of us have Julys. 
July for Tim was a big one. He says, my wife and I found ourselves in a tough spot, and my I got this, I can do this on my own attitude had us wondering if we'd even continue on being married. I thought we were going to throw it all away. It was the lowest part of my life, and one evening I decided to call a friend, and I've never broke down like I did that night in this kitchen. I learned about Jesus and his love and his plan for me, and that day Jesus saved me. Jesus, his words, made me new. I went home and I began a total life switch. It was slow, but God was changing me. Me and Ashley started to connect on a new level that I didn't even know was possible. We worked through difficult situations, and our family has been growing stronger. My marriage is not just surviving anymore. It's thriving because of Jesus. Joy is in our home. I felt like I had acted my way through the first 35 years, and now I am finally free. I used to live only for myself, but now my chains have broke because of Jesus, and I'm experiencing freedom in my life. Gang, I'm telling you, there's a new available for all of us who have Jesus in our life. And you might be here today going, I, I want to experience that. I want to experience this new that you talk about, and yet you just kind of wonder, like, what does that mean? And I would just ask you this question to just dive in a little bit more. Uh, what would it take for somebody who loved you and loves you and knows all about you to look at you and go, who are you and what would you do with them? You know, like what would it take for somebody to see you who knows you, who knows the, the quirks that you have and the good days and the bad days and, and for you to grow in such a way that they'd say, what's happened to you? That's what we all want is for something new to happen on the inside that radically affects the people around us so that they just scratch their head and go, I kind of want that. And again, Paul tells us of what the Holy Spirit can do inside of us. And I think there's some new things that we can grab a hold of if we let the Holy Spirit produce them inside of us. His word's not mine. In Galatians 5, it says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of stuff in our lives. Stuff like love and joy and peace and patience. Like if there was more patience in your life, would people go, I like the new you. You're just like, I like that person. That Patience looks good on you. <laughs> but it goes on to say more things. You know, kindness and goodness and gentleness for heaven's self-control, which that's my thing. It's like if I had more self-control in my life, I think the people around me would go, Man, I like that. That looks good on you. Keep wearing that. <laughs> like, keep wearing that. At which the next verse, which is so fascinating, says this. It says, those who, big word, belong. Those who have Jesus, those who are doing their best to follow with him, what have they done? They've nailed the passions and their desires of their sinful nature to his cross, and they've crucified them there. And every time I read that verse, I actually feel like it's like I'm taking off a coat. I'm just like, I don't even want that anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm just ready for it to be off me, and, and I just want it over there. It's just time for that to go. It's time for me to no longer wear the same thing that I've been wearing. It's time for some new clothes. And it's ironic that Paul goes on to say this in another book of the Bible. He says this in Colossians 3. You must actually clothe yourself with something different. If you want to have some new within you, quite honestly, there's some clothes that you've been wearing. There's some things in the basement. There's some lies that you believe in that just you got to take them off and get rid of them and put on some new ones to make some room i got to get rid of the old to make some room for the new. He says, clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. It reminds me, I used to have these, these tan, pleated, corduroy pants. And they were like the most, they're kind of like minivan pants. You know, like they're just awesome. Baggy, they felt good. They looked like my grandpa's grandpa wore them. And quite honestly, I think they were his. You know, they were hand-me-down pants. And, and I remember <laughs> they're pleated at the bottom. And every time I wore them, people were just like, dang. You, gotta, you know, that, that looked like, that's not good. And my wife told me one day, she's like, those have got to go. And I remember thinking, no, those are my pants. And she's like, they're not even your pants. Those are hand-me-down pants. You know, like, just let them go. And it made me think of this. I didn't even tell the first service this. Some of us are wearing some clothes that are hand-me-downs. They're not even yours to own. Just get rid of them. Just to, if, if you can think of the thing in your life that's, that's holding you back, would you now know that you've been created new? The old clothes aren't even yours anymore. It's time for you to say, God, i got some new ones to wear. I'm going to clothe myself with the very things you might want. And they might fit weird right away because new clothes do. You're like, that, that doesn't fit. I'm used to my corduroys. <laughs> 
But man, I want to get used to the new things. I want to let God change the love meter in my life and the patience and the goodness and the self-control. I want those things to increase and I want the old to decrease. I know I'm not in total victory. I know I have it because of what Christ has done for me, but there's a long ways between where I'm at right now and someday me being in heaven. And so in the meantime, I want to grow into the new clothes that I'm going to be wearing forever. You got me? The third insight, the last one I'll share, is this, the faith line doesn't mean the finish line. The faith line isn't the finish line. The last part of the verse says, anyone who belongs to Christ, to Jesus, if you belong to him, and I just love that, you can belong to him, and it's just crazy to me, They've become a new person. The old life is gone, and the new life has actually begun. It's, it's this reminder that, and again, we call it the faith line. When you choose to give your life to Jesus, you're not like done. It's not like, I did it. I said the prayer. I'm good. See ya. And it just got started. Reminds me of my wedding day when I saw Carrie walking down the aisle. I didn't think to myself, well, I said I do, and I'm good. And I'll tell her if I think of it. You know, like, it's just, I just got started. I just got started in this relationship. And for some of us in the room, maybe the thing that needs to go is a little bit of apathy and complacency that has creeped its way into the basement. And you're going, ah, man, I I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on any bit of the life that God's called me to. It's too great. Time is too precious for me to miss out on the journey that God has us all in on together. The faith line is not the finish line. The old life is gone. The new life has just, big word, begun. I'm wondering today if there is an action step for each and every one of us. Maybe for some of you, you're here and you're hearing this message and right out of the chute you're going like, I know what's in, my, in the basement of my life. And it's time for me to be done. I know that, that that thing that I've held on to since college is still gripping me. You know, like my attitude, my behavior, that critical spirit, the way I treat other people when I get angry, for heaven, it's about time that goes. And I make some room for what Jesus wants to do in my life. Others of you, you're here today and you're going, my goodness, I've just never belonged. I've came and I've, I've watched and I've seen. And maybe, just maybe today, today's your day where you're going to say, I don't want to live in total defeat. I believe that there's a new me that I can't wait to experience, and it's one prayer away when we give our lives to Jesus and we start growing with him. Would you pray with me, and we'll, we'll just see what God does in these next few moments. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thanks for a chance to be together. God, it is my hope. Today, right now, that you would just be working on our hearts. If there's something in us that just we need to be done with, I'm praying that you would reveal it. For some of us, this will come really easy, and we just knew right away that pattern, that behavior, that thing that we run to. It's just a settling. And we don't want to settle. You're too good. And what you have in store for us is too great for us to, to go on cruise control in this life. And so, God, I'm just praying for anybody in the room who, who can think of that thing in us right now that it's got to go. That we would do one word today. That we would repent. And it's a big word. And for some of you, if you're new here, to hear, I don't even know what that means. It just means remember. It means remember and run. I'm going to remember how good God is. and I'm going to remember what this, if I stay in it, will do to me. And so I'm going to run back to God. I'm going to remember that where I'm at is not okay. Like the boy in Luke 15. I'm going to come to my senses. I'm going to repent. And then I'm going to run towards the Father and experience all he has for me. What is it in your life that you need to repent of? And for others of you, maybe you're here and you're going, I've just never stepped over that line of faith. I've belonged to revision but maybe I don't belong to Jesus yet. And quite possibly you've heard that there's a new available for you and it's one prayer away where you give your heart and life completely to this Jesus. And I don't want to miss this moment for you. 
So if that's you, you can pray this. It doesn't have to be out loud, but it's you surrendering your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Something like this. God, today I'm giving you my life. I don't understand it all yet, but God, I know that there is something that you have in store for me, and I've been settling for less. And so today, God, I surrender my life. I need your grace, and I need your forgiveness to change me. So God, I'm giving you my life, my everything. Take all of me, my basement, my lies, the parts of me that I've been hiding because of shame. God, I give it to you, and I receive your forgiveness. Would you make me new? Today, I am yours. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. God, I'm grateful for it. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.